This video is about the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, but we are examining wrong answers only. Greetings, my name is Stephen Myers, and I am the founder of the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation. The purpose of this video is to address a single specific question. That question is, how was the Great Pyramid built? The reality is, the original builders created the Great Pyramid in one specific way. How the Great Pyramid was built is literally set in stone. How the original builders actually built the Great Pyramid is the correct answer to the question we are addressing. Yet you would be surprised as to how many different answers there are to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? But in this video, we will focus on a single type or category of answer to the question we are addressing. That specific type of answer is, drum roll please, not a rim shot, drum roll please, incorrect answers only. Yes, incorrect answers. We will address incorrect answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? The first thing that must be addressed is the obvious question of, why spend time on wrong answers? Why do that? What is the point? How is that helpful? Wrong answers are very helpful. Wrong answers help in the process of understanding what is not the correct answer. It is imperative to have the ability to correctly identify wrong answers. It will benefit you tremendously in your path of discovery as a researcher to be able to recognize and reject the many wrong answers given for the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Wrong answers are very important and I will give two examples to help illustrate that fact. Thomas Edison used the scientific method and performed experiments to develop a working light bulb. In the process of developing the light bulb, he performed 10,000 experiments that did not work. In effect, each of these 10,000 experiments was a wrong answer to the question, uh, how is a working light bulb made? This famous quote attributed to Thomas Edison indicates that Edison contended the 10,000 failed experiments, which were wrong answers, were very helpful. He was able to discard ideas that were not valid. Wow! According to Edison, wrong answers were very important and provided a tremendous benefit. Here is another example indicating how powerful wrong answers are. Mark Twain also had a very high respect for wrong answers. He indicates from this quote attributed to him that it is better to be ignorant of something than to embrace wrong answers. Most researchers think that there is nothing worse than to be ignorant of something. Mark Twain and I would disagree. Wrong answers are much worse than not knowing something. He goes so far as to say wrong answers are so dangerous they will get you into trouble. So it is important to be able to identify and reject wrong answers. I wish I could ask Mark Twain this question. Is it better to be ignorant of how the Great Pyramid was built than to know for sure how the Great Pyramid was built but what you know just isn't so. His answer would be yes, it would be better not to know than to know something that just isn't so. Mark Twain, Mark Twain addresses an important concept. Recognizing and rejecting wrong answers is a very important skill to learn in the process of conducting research. So, wrong answers are important and serve a valuable purpose in the process of conducting research. Wrong answers are also very dangerous and a source of trouble. The noble purpose of this video is to help researchers like you recognize wrong answers so you as a researcher 
will not embrace the incorrect answers you will receive when you ask the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Also, this video is intended to help researchers like you who may have embraced wrong answers to recognize and reject those wrong answers uh, you have embraced as valid. This video is also intended to help people stop providing wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? If you provide any of the following wrong answers that this video highlights, then this video was created to help you in a very profound way. It will help you to stop providing falsehoods as answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? The Great Pyramid seems to be a structure that elicits a huge number of wrong answers from both academic scholars as well as your everyday run-of-the-mill low-information researcher. The six-word question we are addressing elicits wrong answers like you wouldn't believe, that is, until you watch this video. These wrong answers are like a cocoon of misinformation that the Great Pyramid is shrouded in. As a researcher, it is in your best interest to be able to reject those wrong answers and peel away that cloak or cocoon of misinformation as you pursue truth. I am here to tell you that you do not have to settle for wrong answers, and I am here to help you keep from being a person that provides wrong answers to the question we are addressing in this video. We will discuss a lot of wrong answers and maybe you will recognize some wrong answers that you embrace. Let's find out. Assisting me in the production of this video is my good friend and associate Harley over there in the control booth. Hi Harley. Since Harley is in the control booth, if anything gets out of control, it's Harley's fault. Stop, Harley. That's enough applause. We are filming this YouTube video here in Studio B of our Nonprofit Foundation's research facility. Here is the link to our YouTube channel. We use Studio A for our documentaries. We have produced two documentaries over in Studio A. The pictures of the covers of our documentaries are on the screen as well as the Amazon links for both documentaries. Both are available in DVD format and Harley and I hope you watch both of them. You will be glad you did. Virtually everyone has been given an answer or has given an answer to the question, how is the Great Pyramid built? Yet those answers uh, to that single question are as varied as the people who provide those answers. These varied answers to a single specific question often contradict each other and not all of them can possibly be correct. The correct answer to the question is literally set in stone. The Great Pyramid is the result of the construction process which is the answer to how was the Great Pyramid built? Many many people at one time knew the correct answer because they were participants in the construction process or eyewitnesses to the construction process. The correct answer was certainly knowable and common knowledge by those who built the Great Pyramid, but that was then and this is now. We are now seemingly in an age of wrong answers, so to help the viewer become a better researcher, we are addressing the wrong answers that are provided for the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? But before we start, I just want to clarify one thing. It amazes me that I think I need to do this, but I want to explain what a wrong answer is. I have to explain what a wrong answer is, is because many who study the Great Pyramid are easily duped by wrong answers, so knowing what a wrong answer is will help tremendously. Here is a question. 2 plus 2 equals what? The obvious answer is 4. So a correct answer is an answer that is paired with the appropriate question. 4 is a wonderful correct answer to that specific question, yet 4 may not be a correct answer if it is paired with a different question. All by itself, 
4 is just 4. 4 as an answer has to be paired with the appropriate question for 4 to be a correct answer. To illustrate what I mean, we will keep the same answer and then pair it with a different question. Then 4 becomes a wrong answer. Another concept we have to address is that a true statement can be a wrong answer. Here's what I mean. What if a teacher asks, what is the correct answer to 2 plus 3? If an answer, if a student answers by telling the teacher that 2 plus 2 equals 4, the student provided a true statement, but it was a wrong answer to the question that was asked. This type of thing happens a lot when people uh, respond to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? People respond by providing statements that may or may not be true, but do not answer the question. Here's another more relevant example to explain what a wrong answer is using the six word question we are dealing with. This example illustrates the idea that an answer is wrong if it is paired with a question that the answer does not answer. Here is the question. How was the Great Pyramid built? Let's say someone provides this answer to our question. The workers were not slaves. That statement in and of itself may be true. We are not debating that right now. But when that statement, which may or may not be true, is given as an answer to be paired with the question we are addressing, then that statement is a wrong answer. So even though a statement may be true, if it is paired with a specific question that the statement doesn't answer, then the statement is a wrong answer. How, how can we tell if an answer, even, it, even if it's a statement that is probably true, is a wrong answer? This is how we tell. If the statement that may or may not be true does not answer the question, then the statement is incorrect as an answer to the question. We are addressing a specific six-word question, and if someone provides a statement that doesn't answer the question, then that person has provided a wrong answer to the question. That seems simple enough, and it is a straightforward research technique, but in my experience, is that any time you deal with people studying the Great Pyramid, uh, they are very unsophisticated in their understanding of valid research techniques. If people did understand valid research techniques, then they wouldn't embrace or even provide wrong answers to how was the Great Pyramid built. Again, the workers may not have been slaves, yet that statement, provided as an answer to the question we are addressing, is a wrong answer because it doesn't answer the question. As we progress, we will see many more examples of statements that may or may not be true, but end up being wrong answers when paired to the six word question we are addressing in this video. What, Harley? Oh, he wants me to get on with it. Okay, Harley, here we go. So let's get started. We are dealing with one specific six word question. How was the Great Pyramid built? We have already encountered a wrong answer. It doesn't matter if the workers were slaves or free citizens in regards to the question we are addressing. Let's pretend the workers were free men and not slaves. Did that answer the question? Or in other words, did the answer explain how the Great Pyramid was built? No, it did not answer the question, so the statement provided as an answer is wrong. The litmus test for wrong answer to the question we are addressing is, if the answer did not answer the question, then the answer is a wrong answer. That seems fair enough, but anytime you're dealing with people who study the Great Pyramid, you really have to be careful and explain anything related to valid research techniques. People comfortable with wrong answers have trouble with this concept, so let's look at another example to help understand. Let's say I ask, how did a cotton gin work? 
That is the device Eli Whitney invented to remove cotton seeds from cotton fiber. The answer to that question has nothing to do with whether or not the person turning the crank was a free man or slave. Let's say we answer the question by saying the person turning the crank on the cotton gin happens to be a free citizen. That doesn't answer the question. I have turned the crank on a cotton gin. Therefore, the answer which addresses the citizenship status of cotton gin crank turners it was a wrong answer to the question, how does a cotton gin work? Let's continue with identifying some more wrong answers. This will help you identify wrong answers and improve your ability to conduct research. Just maybe we will touch on a wrong answer that you embrace or a wrong answer you tell people when you are asked, how was the Great Pyramid built? We will continue with the most obvious source of so many wrong answers to that question. That source is the so-called science of Egyptology. <laughs> That's enough, Arlie. Now remember, we are asking a specific six-word question. How is the Great Pyramid built? Egyptologists will start telling you about a big mega ramp that was bigger than the Great Pyramid and that sweaty knuckle draggers with strong back muscles pulled up the pulled stones up the mythical mega ramp all day long. You would think that the so-called experts, known as Egyptologists, would engage in the scientific method and provide at least one valid demonstration to substantiate their quote answer unquote to the question. Yet the reality is that the entire science of Egyptology has never lifted a single payload the weight of a 16-ton casing stone one inch. But they say workers were able to move stones all day long. The largest stones of the Great Pyramid are 70 tons, and a payload uh, the weight of the most massive stones will never ever be moved by Egyptology the, the distance of one inch. The unproven and undemonstrated ramp hypothesis is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built. But uh, that is not the only wrong answer provided by Egyptology. That science, which abhors the scientific method, willingly provides many more wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Egyptologists, when asked how was the Great Pyramid built, will tell you that the pre, uh, precision stone cutting was accomplished using hand tools. Precision stone cutting is part of the construction process because many of the stones of the Great Pyramid are cut with high precision. But the only science that hates the scientific method, Egyptology, has never made a single casing stone cut to the same size and precision as those found at the Great Pyramid. Egyptology has never even cut a single surface of a single casing stone like those of the Great Pyramid. The reason for this lack of demonstrations for Egyptology's explanations is because Egyptology is incorrect and their fanciful stories are impossible to demonstrate, making the idea of precision stone cutting using pounders or hand tools a wrong answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? So when you hear the words big ramp and precision stone cutting using hand tools, you can rest assured that you are being told wrong answers by a scientific method hating science, which is very comfortable with telling wrong answers. I don't even know anyone past the eighth grade that actually believes that large-scale precision stone cutting can be produced using hand tools. Yet this falsehood is still being taught in universities. Shame on universities that teach falsehoods. Shame, shame on you. Egyptology doesn't stop there with wrong answers. No, not by a long shot. When our six-word question is asked, Egyptologists will tell you about mastabas and the sequence of pyramid construction. If you hear the word mastaba, 
or are told the supposed sequence of pyramid construction, you are being told a wrong answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? What, Harley? Yes, I know. The supposed sequence of Great Pyramid construction doesn't answer uh, the question, and mastabas have nothing to do with the construction project known as the Great Pyramid. Thank you for agreeing with me, Harley. A fascinating characteristic of Egyptologists is that they are very content with providing wrong answers, and they have many wrong answers to choose from. Let's look at some more. When asked the six-word question, how is the Great Pyramid built, Egyptologists will tell you about mummies or about the type of hat the, feather, the pharaoh wore or tell you about hieroglyphics or mention Himhotet. If someone is answering the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, and their answer includes words like pharaoh, hat, mummy, embalming, or Himhotet, you are being told a wrong answer by someone who likes to embrace wrong answers. It's as simple as that. Were there mummies in ancient Egypt? Yes. Did the pharaoh wear a hat? Yes. But if that is what you are told as an answer to how the Great Pyramid was built, then you are being told wrong answers. Just so you know, Egyptologists say Himhotet didn't design or build or even see the Great Pyramid. So mentioning Himhotet is a wrong answer to how is the Great Pyramid built? Egyptology does not stop there. They have so many more wrong answers, but we will just mention a few more and then go on to other sources of wrong answers. Egyptology is so clever in their wrong answers that they deserve the special attention we are giving them. Remember now, we are dealing with wrong answers to the question, how is the Great Pyramid built? If you are told about 80-pound sun-baked mud bricks and how they were moved and made, you are being told a wrong answer. If an Egyptologist or anyone parroting what Egyptologists say tells you an answer to the question and the answer involves king's lists or pyramid texts or the Book of the Dead or the words Khufu or Cheops or King's Tut's Mask, you are being told a wrong answer by someone who likes to tell wrong answers. Let's say I ask this six-word question. How was the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State built? If someone tells me about a president's list or what type of hat President uh, Roosevelt wore and the symbolic meaning of his hat or how his body was prepared for his funeral, then the answers being provided to the question, how was the Grand Coulee Dam built, are wrong answers. That is as dumb as talking about a king's list or pyramid text or book of the dead when providing an answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built. What'd you say, Harley? Yes, you're right. There is nothing about the Great Pyramid that indicates the builders intended any relationship between the Great Pyramid and the pyramid and the pyramid tax or Book of the Dead. There is no Great Pyramid feature that indicates uh, the builders intended any relationship between the Great Pyramid and any of those things. Yes, I know, Harley. But there are a lot of people that don't understand that. Where the workers lived is a wrong answer. Yes, the workers lived somewhere. But where the workers lived is a wrong answer to the question we are addressing. Let's say I ask this six-word question. How was the space shuttle built? And someone answers uh, by telling me the location of the neighborhoods in which the space shuttle workers lived. Where the workers lived who built the space shuttle is a wrong answer to how was the space shuttle built. Just as where the workers lived is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built.
Another answer provided to the question we are addressing is, the workers were proud to build the pyramid for the king or pharaoh. That is a humdinger of a wrong answer. The attitude or amount of pride the workers supposedly had or didn't have is a very bad and very wrong answer. I live in a small community that has a plywood mill. It's at the edge of town. Let's say I ask the question, how is plywood manufactured? If someone answers by telling me all about how the workers are proud to work for their employer to mass produce plywood, then I know I'm getting a stupid answer to the question I asked. The amount of pride plywood workers have uh, does not tell me the manufacturing process used to mass produce plywood. The same holds true when workers' pride is provided as an answer to how is the Great Pyramid built. When they say the word pride, you know you are receiving a wrong answer. Harley, did you work down at the plywood mill? Were the workers proud? Oh, I thought you worked down there, but you haven't. Okay. If I said to you that the workers were proud to make plywood, does that tell you how plywood was manufactured? Harley says that uh, that would be a stupid answer. So pride is a wrong answer. I'm glad we got that settled, Harley. Thanks for the help. Here's another wrong answer to our six word question. Uh, the building of the Great Pyramid unified the ancient Egyptian civilization. For the same reason pride is a wrong answer, so is unification a wrong answer. Let's say ancient Egypt was unified. Did that tell us how the Great Pyramid was assembled? No, it did not answer it, because it's a wrong answer. Does the word unification explain how 70 ton stones were moved to a height of 300 feet and set in place with no handling scars? No, the word unification does not explain that process, so it is a wrong answer. I hope you don't give someone the unification wrong answer when you answer the question we are addressing. These are all wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? If you provide any of these wrong answers, don't do it anymore because you are just embarrassing yourself. If people tell you about ancient religion or say the word priesthood, they are giving you wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Uh, words like religion, priests, and gods are red flags indicating you are being told a wrong answer by someone who believes wrong answers and wants you to believe wrong answers too. Let's say I ask, how was a cathedral built? And then someone answers by telling me about the Pope or Jesus or monks, or the Trinity, or they quote Bible verses. If that happens, I know I would be getting uh, a wrong answers to the question, how was a cathedral built? If you get an answer that involves religion, gods, or priesthoods, you know for sure that you are getting a wrong answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Here are some ancient gods that didn't build the Great Pyramid. Uh, gods are an incorrect answer to uh, how the Great Pyramid was built. When you ask the specific question addressed in this video and you are told about the yearly flood or agricultural practices or farming, then you are being told wrong answers. Those subjects did not tell you how stones were moved from the quarries and then placed at their final location. These answers did not tell you how the stones were piled on top of each other, so these are wrong answers. We have covered just a very small sampling of wrong answers proudly provided by Egyptologists to the question we are addressing. But we don't want to just single out the failed science of Egyptology with wrong answers it embraces. There are so many other sources of wrong answers that we can look at. 
The realm of what I call low information researchers has embraced many other wrong answers to the question uh, we are addressing. This type of investigator, known as a low information researcher, relies heavily on poor research methods and low standards of evidence as well as their imagination to make up answers to the question, how is the Great Pyramid built? When answering the six word question we are addressing, low information researchers will start telling you about fake non-existent passages and chambers. When this happens, then you know you are being told the wrong answer. Fake made up Great Pyramid passages and chambers are a very hot topic right now. With just a quick look on the internet, you will find so many fake passages and chambers that the Great Pyramid would be almost hollow if all of these fake passages and chambers existed. But fake passages are a fake answer to the legitimate question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Fake made up Great Pyramid passages and chambers are such a fascinating subject that Harley and I produced a video about that very subject. It is on our YouTube channel, but the direct link for that specific fascinating and informative and very popular video is on the screen. I hope you watch it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll be glad you did. Those same people who are infatuated with fake made up passages and chambers are also obsessed with telling you what the purpose of the Great Pyramid is and how fake passages and fake chambers relate to the fake purpose the great of the Great Pyramid. If you are being told what the made up purpose of the Great Pyramid is to justify made up passages and chambers as an answer to how was the Great Pyramid built, then no matter what, you are being told a wrong answer. When someone asks you, how was the Great Pyramid built? Do you start talking about fake made up passages and chambers that don't exist? If you do, then you are providing wrong answers and you should knock it off. Yes, I said knock it off right now. Believing in fake made up passages is the definitive characteristic of being a low information researcher. When someone provides an answer to the six word question that includes a description of what a word means, then you instantly know that you are being told a wrong answer. So it should go without saying, but I will say it anyway, that if someone answers the question by telling you about the pronunciation of words and their meaning, then they are happy as a clam to provide to you a wrong answer. If they tell you the Egyptian name of the Nile River, and tell you how to pronounce it or expound at length about the proper pronunciation of ancient words like Himhotet or anything like that, then their answer is wrong because they are not answering the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? And if you are told what the word pyramid means or the ancient Egyptian pronunciation of pyramid as an answer, you are being told a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built? What, Harley? Yes, Harley agrees the proper pronunciation of a word is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built. Let's say I ask this six word question. How was an aircraft carrier built? If someone answers me by telling me the proper pronunciation of the word aircraft, and carrier, I have instantly I instantly know I have received a wrong answer, and the guy giving me the wrong answer, which includes word pronunciation, is clueless. New age low information researchers really come up with some doozies when answering the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? They can come up with so many wrong answers it will make your head spin. These new age low information research researchers come up with wrong answers like a magician can pull a rabbit out of a hat. I have had new age low information researchers get offended 
When I refer to them as new age, low information researchers, they say they know a lot of information, so they are not lo low information researchers. I smile and ask them about the difference between unacceptable research methods and legitimate academic research techniques, and they are overwhelmed by that question. Not knowing the difference between invalid and valid research methods is what makes them low information researchers. I rest my case. If they knew about valid research techniques, they would not embrace false answers and would not spread false answers that were derived using the poor research methods and low standards of evidence that low information researchers embrace. When asked the six word question we are addressing in this video, uh, new age low information researchers like to tell you about emerald tablets or golden tablets or the book of Enoch or Thrawn Hermes. If you are given an answer to the question, how is the Great Pyramid built? That includes words like Thrawn or Thor or emerald tablets or any of that then there is no doubt about it, you are getting a wrong answer. If you give an answer to the six word question that includes words like Thrawn or Thor or the Book of Enoch or Thrawn Hermes or Emerald Tablets, you are providing a wrong answer uh, to the question. Shame on you. Shame on you. Tisk tip. If the answer you receive to the six word question includes the word initiation into secret societies or mystery religions or any type of ceremony, then the answer is wrong. Let's say I went into the Hoover Dam and was initiated into a mystery religion. Then someone asked me, how was the Hoover Dam built? If I told them about my initiation into a mystery religion, my answer would be wrong. Uh, here is a characteristic of wrong answer givers who tell other people wrong answers to the six word question we are addressing. Wrong answer givers don't like to give direct coherent responses when their answers are questioned. This is because to engage in open minded discussion about their wrong answers would shed light onto the flaws uh, of the wrong answers they cherish and shed light on the invalid research methods wrong answer uh, givers provide. Uh, let me give you an example of not providing coherent responses when questioning the wrong answers that low information researchers provide. When a wrong answer giver is asked the six word question we are addressing, he will respond by saying something like, Thrawn built the Great Pyramid because uh, the Emerald Tablets say so. When someone gives uh, an answer like that, I ask if there is a specific feature to the Great Pyramid which indicates Thrawn or the Emerald Tablets had anything to do with building the Great Pyramid? That's a straightforward question. A wrong answer giver will respond with something like, yes, the Emerald Tablets of Thrawn says Thrawn built the Great Pyramid. Didn't you read the book? I simply point out that Thrawn, the Emerald Tablet, or th uh, th Thrawn, or the book that they're referring to, is not a feature specific to the Great Pyramid. Wrong answer givers can't just say that there is no feature specific to the Great Pyramid, indicating the construction of the Great Pyramid had anything to do with Thrawn or, or an emerald tablet. Wrong answer givers can't say that truthful statement, which would threaten the wrong answers they cherish. So, wrong answer givers have a vested interest in refusing to allow their wrong answers to be analyzed or questioned. When questioning the answers given by uh, wrong answer givers, something invariably happens. When new age low information researchers have their answers questioned, they get indignant and upset that you want a straight up response 
when their wrong answers are questioned. They would rather get mad than give a straightforward answer. If their answer is questioned, they get hot under the collar. They get mad and angry and defensive instead of just engaging in open-minded dialogue. Arlie, silence your phone. We are taping live right now. What? It's a caller? How can we have someone calling in? Can such a thing even be possible? This isn't a talk show. It's a YouTube video we are producing. And yet, Harley says we have a caller. Anything can happen when you tape live. I try to make myself available to people as a public service uh, that we provide at our foundation at thepump.org. Also, that is why I have made myself available to be on so many radio talk show interviews to help people on their quest to acquire truth. It's all part of the service we provide. Okay, Harley, patch them through to my phone and I will find out uh, what the caller wants. I got the phone right here. What? It's a video call? Wow. The wonders of technology. Okay, Harley. Put it on the screen so the audience can see the caller. Thanks, Harley. Uh, <laughs> Harley's so handy. Okay, here it comes now. Thank you for calling in. What is your question? Stop or talking concern about the wrong answers I, I believe with. in. Stop questioning the wrong answers to your dumb question. Don't even ask how the Great Pyramid was built. I like my wrong answers, and I will keep giving wrong answers. Stop what you are doing. Just stop. There is nothing wrong with wrong answers. Quit telling people why my wrong answers are wrong. Stop. 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 I'm going to keep giving wrong hey, answers Harley. no matter what. Harley, cut the I feed. hate you for pointing out Harley, my wrong answers. This caller's out of control and entirely it. invested in their wrong answers. Hang up, Harley. Hang up. Wow, I'm glad that's over. The reason why they get so upset is because instead of discussing ideas based on the results of legitimate academic research techniques, they are trying to protect their wrong answers that have a foundation in invalid research methods which produce logical fallacies. Be prepared to encounter people who get very hot under the collar and prepare to receive a lot of attitude when pointing out to the person giving you a wrong answer that they are giving you a wrong answer. Wrong answer givers cherish their wrong answers and will defend their wrong answers until the cows come home. What was that, Harley? And here is another characteristic of wrong answer givers. They rely on using debating tactics or rhetorical ploys instead of providing a coherent explanation of the wrong answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? When someone is using debating ploys, it can be a strong indicator you are being told wrong answers. Debating ploys can include answering a question with a question, cherry-picking unrelated uh, data points, appeal to authority, becoming indignant, providing false dichotomies, circular reasoning, uh, making threats and hurling insults, and even changing the subject are just a few examples of debating ploys used by wrong answer givers when their wrong answers are threatened. But let's get back to some more wrong answers. We are still addressing the same six word question. If the answer focuses on sacred cubits or sacred geometry or ley lines, then you are getting a wrong answer. Sacred geometry didn't move stones, so sacred geometry is a wrong answer. Also, if you are told about any units of measure, then you are getting a wrong answer from someone who likes wrong answers. Let's say I ask this six word question. How was an aircraft carrier built? And someone answers by saying the metric system was used. Did a unit of measure build the Great Pyramid? 
discussing the unit of measure is actually a wrong answer to how was an aircraft carrier assembled because a unit of measure is not a construction process. The same is true for providing a unit of measure to answer how was the Great Pyramid built. People also try to give math related answers such as pi or phi in their answer to the question. Did pi move heavy stones? Saying the word math is a very poor answer to how was the Great Pyramid built. Everything has math, so math is not a very good description of the process of building the Great Pyramid. My pencil exhibits pi in its design and math was involved in my pencil's design and construction. But just saying math related stuff like math is a universal language is not a description of the construction process and math is a wrong answer to how the uh, uh, how a pencil was built, just as uh, math is a wrong answer to how the Great Pyramid was built. Also, when somebody tells you about the capstone and what they think the capstone was made of and what the capstone was for, you are receiving yet another wrong answer. I think, uh, I think you're all getting the hang of it. For some reason, uh, many people want to answer the question by telling you how old they think the Great Pyramid is. How old the Great Pyramid is does not answer the question, how is the Great Pyramid built? So the age of the Great Pyramid is a wrong answer to the question we are addressing. I have a friend who has a Model T Ford. I asked him, how was this Model T Ford built? He's a smart guy. He didn't tell me how old the Model T is or what year it was originally built. Uh, to, to answer my question. He wouldn't do that because those are wrong answers to the question I asked. I wish people who studied the Great Pyramid were as adverse to wrong answers as my friend is. Oh well, at least it is good to know that when the Great Pyramid was built is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built. In other words, when is not how. If you are told who built the Great Pyramid as an answer to how the Great Pyramid was built, you are receiving a wrong answer. If you hear words like Caffrey or Chevron or Cheops or Thor or Aliens or Thor Hermes or the Akanaki or the Nephilim or Giants or UFOs, then you are being told a wrong answer. Who built the Great Pyramid is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built? Or, to put it concisely, who is not how? People like to tell you about ley lines or an energy grid or a worldwide system of pyramids all over the planet when they answer the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? But those are yet more examples of wrong answers to the question. None, none of that has anything to do with answering the specific question how was the Great Pyramid built? Uh, did ley lines build the Great Pyramid or help build the Great Pyramid? No coherent answer to that question is ever provided. If you are told the Great Pyramid is a Giza power plant that transmits microwave energy to UFOs as an answer to the question we are addressing, then that answer is wrong. Uh, if you told people that the Great Pyramid is a weapon or vibrates or reduces earthquakes or is a beacon for aliens as an answer to the question we are addressing, then you have told people wrong answers. Did Nikola Tesla build the Great Pyramid or even say how the Great Pyramid was built? No, he did not. So if you mention Nikola Tesla in your answer, it is a sure sign that you are giving someone a wrong answer and you should know better. Isn't it amazing just how many wrong answers there are to a single question? I wonder how many wrong answers you have been told and I also wonder how many of these wrong answers you have told people as you attempt to convince people these wrong answers are valid. Hey Harley, do you tell people any of these wrong answers? 
Of course you don't. Harley, you know better than that. Good job, Harley. Religious folk have their own collection of wrong answers. Those people, who are proponents of pyramidology, also known as the biblical correlation theory, contend there are a bunch of correlations between the Great Pyramid and the Holy Bible. So, these religious folk will provide answers that include concepts like Pyramid Inch, Bible Prophecy, Adam, Garden of Eden, Noah's Flood, or the Biblical Flood. They will tell you about Job and Enoch. They will tell you about the Great Pyramid's Bethlehem angle that they contend confirms the location of Jesus' birthplace. If you hear words like Pyramid Inch, or Bible Prophecy, or Noah, or Garden of Eden, or Jesus, or Jew, or Hebrew, then you know you are receiving a wrong answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? Also, for some unknown reason, people want to tell you what they think the age of the Sphinx is to answer the question. Whatever the age of the Sphinx is, it is a wrong answer to the question we are addressing. If you get an answer to the question we are addressing that contains the word Sphinx, then you are getting a wrong answer. Uh, one other type of wrong answer can easily be identified when someone provides an answer that includes the word pyramids in it, it is automatically a wrong answer. Some people try to use some type of a blanket approach and say that every pyramid was built in the same way, so they try to tell you how pyramids, plural, were built. This one-size-fits-all explanation is automatically incorrect, so an answer that lumps many uh, pyramids together is by definition a wrong answer. Here is an example to help illustrate what I am saying. A canoe is a floating vessel. A battleship is a floating vessel. Trying to group these very different floating vessels together with a single explanation as to how all floating vessels are made in the same way is a bizarre exercise in futility providing a wrong answer. Some pyramids in the Valley of the Nile are made out of relatively small, sun-baked mud bricks, contending that these small payloads were moved in the same manner as massive, multiple-ton stones is wrong. So when you hear the word pyramids, plural, you are being given a wrong answer by someone who doesn't know any better. Probably the person telling you that wrong answer, which includes the word pyramids, has never moved a stone larger than uh, one in his kidney. <laughs> Thank you. And the last category of wrong answers we are going to examine is wrong answers provided by people who believe the fake, made-up Great Pyramid correlations without causation that are so popular right now. People who try to understand the Great Pyramid by trying to figure out what points to what star or alignments or correlations have a tremendously difficult time answering the specific question we are addressing in this video. There is a reason for this. The rather poor research method they use to understand the Great Pyramid is to see what points to something or see what feature is in alignment with something else and then just simply declare an edict that shazam, it's a correlation, even though there is no causation. They try to understand the Great Pyramid by simply believing a correlation without causation that some modern person came up with and contend that the made-up logical fallacies of correlations without causation are somehow profoundly significant. People with that mindset are at a terrible disadvantage in trying to provide an answer or even address the six-word question, how was the Great Pyramid built? This is because the Great Pyramid is already assembled. What something points to or some perceived alignment has nothing to do with and does not answer uh, how the Great Pyramid was built. The poor research technique they have chosen to embrace as a method to understand the Great Pyramid 
is a crippling drawback to determining how the Great Pyramid was built. What stars the vents used to point to in the past, or what stars the vents actually do point to now, or of something arbitra some arbitrary grouping of multiple pyramids look like the Milky Way, or if a cloud looks like a puppy dog, or if chicken entrails can per, uh, foretell the future, are all wrong answers to how is the Great Pyramid built. So if you ask our specific question, and the answer you receive is that something points to a star, or such and such a feature aligns to something else, then you know in your heart of hearts that you are being given a wrong answer by someone who should know better. Therefore, correlation without causation believers avoid the question we are addressing like the plague. When absolutely compelled to, correlation without causation believers have no other choice but to provide wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? But usually they shy away from that question at all costs because their mindset causes them to be very ill-equipped to answer the specific question we are addressing. But, occasionally, a correlation without causation believer will be faced with that question and then make a shallow, half-hearted and often incoherent attempt to come up with an answer. Believe it or not, we actually have a rare example of a correlation without causation believer trying to answer that question. Let's analyze the answer. We will analyze Graham Hancock as he provides a response to the question we are addressing. Harley, put the video clip on the screen. Thank you. Graham Hancock is a person who has studied the Great Pyramid and has embraced a bunch of Great Pyramid correlations without causation. He is a person who can tell you what he thinks the builders intended the Great Pyramid to do and what he contends the sophisticated purpose the Great Pyramid was built to serve. Mr. Hancock can and often does talk about the oodles of esoteric and symbolic profundities of the Great Pyramid that he thinks were intended. He can even tell you what points to what star or used to point to a star but points to different stars now. But in this rare case he is being asked the question we are addressing in this video. In other words, he is being asked how rocks were moved and piled on top of each other to build the Great Pyramid. That is all he's being asked. Let's see how he does. Okay, here it comes. How do I think the pyramids were built? To be honest, I have no answer to that question. Okay, thank you for telling us you are honest. Even though you contend you do know all of the sophisticated esoteric stuff about the Great Pyramid, and you do know that uh, the made-up Great Pyramid correlations without causation were somehow intended to be significant, and you can even look into the mind of the builders and somehow know that every alignment that modern people have come up with and every made-up symbolic aspect of the Great Pyramid is absolutely true. You know that and contend you understand all of that lofty information. Yet, you don't know and have no idea at all how the builders were able to move rocks to the building site and then pile these rocks on top of each other? Apparently, by using the research technique of making up correlations, you are ill-equipped to understand or even identify the actual construction process used by the original builders of the Great Pyramid. And anybody who tells you that he or she knows how the pyramids were built are not telling the truth. I find it fascinating that you are identifying liars. You contend that if someone offers any answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, they are automatically a liar 
and every answer to that question must be a lie and wrong. I would contend that if Mr. Hancock were presented with the correct answer to how was the Great Pyramid built, he would not be able to determine or acknowledge that the correct answer is correct. To do that is beyond the scope of his limited research method of coming up with correlations without causation. Apparently, his research method of coming up with correlations without causation is an unacceptable research method to comprehend how stones were moved and stacked on top of each other. Just to set the record straight, when the builders answered the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? They were not liars. Therefore, everyone who has answered that question was not a liar. Because we don't know. We don't know. Generally, in a sentence, what follows after the word because is the reason for what preceded the word because. In other words, this is the way it is because of such and such. What he is saying is, we don't know because we don't know. Wow, that's profound. Actually, it's a classic example of circular reasoning, which is a logical fallacy, and it doesn't really help, but it does sound good at first glance. Evidently, he is speaking for everyone on earth when he says that people don't know because we don't know. He emphasizes the point that we don't know how the Great Pyramid was built. He has been studying this stuff for probably over 35 years, and I get the impression that he feels uh, that we uh, will not know how the Great Pyramid was built. He didn't say that we will know in the future, or that the Great Pyramid is evidence that we can study to understand how the Great Pyramid was built. He didn't say scholars are getting closer to understanding how the Great Pyramid was built. He's simply saying scholars, him included, and everyone else on earth don't know. Is he trying to say that it is an impossibility to know the answer to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? I wonder if he thinks that the original builders knew how the Great Pyramid was built, and the spectators watching the Great Pyramid being built knew how the Great Pyramid was built. If he does think that the builders of the Great Pyramid knew how the Great Pyramid was built, then that would mean the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, has an answer that can be both true and knowable by human beings. It appears that his position is that it cannot be known how the Great Pyramid was built even though people at least at one time did know the correct answer. The Great Pyramid contains a number of mysteries. You would think that it would be the duty and honor of a modern day scholar to try to find out the correct answer that the builders would have and did provide to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? But it seems to me finding out the correct answer to that question is beyond the limited extent of his research abilities and is also seemingly beyond the scope of his interest. His interest is in what points to something and making up correlations without causation. In that how the Great Pyramid was built is not his thing. Let's see if he changes the subject because as we have just seen, correlation without causation believers don't like to talk about how the Great Pyramid was built. The Great Pyramid, first of all, is very big. The Great Pyramid weighs six million tons. We can calculate that from its mass. It weighs, it weighs six million tons. Its footprint is 13 acres. Well, I guess he is changing the subject, which is a type of logical fallacy. He's still talking, so if he is trying to answer the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, he is providing wrong answers. If he's trying to answer the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, by saying that the Great Pyramid is very big, then he's providing a wrong answer. Telling us the weight of the Great Pyramid is also a wrong answer. It's more than 750 feet along each side. The size of the base of the footprint 
is another wrong answer to the question. It's 481 feet tall. The height of the Great Pyramid is a wrong answer to how is the Great Pyramid built. More than two and a half million individual blocks of stone were used in its construction. The number of stones is a wrong answer to how is the Great Pyramid built. But it's not just big. It's really, really precise. Saying the word precision is a wrong answer to how is the Great Pyramid built. The Great, the great Pyramid is locked in to the cardinal dimensions of our planet. The Great Pyramid is targeted on true north within 3 sixtieths of a single degree. Telling us the side of the Great Pyramid is pointing to true north is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built. Again, saying precision, true north, and massive size is to provide wrong answers to how was the Great Pyramid built. Now, no modern builder would create a large building and add onto his or her shoulders the additional burden of aligning it to true north within a fraction of a single degree. They just wouldn't get it. They wouldn't understand why it was important to do that. But something drove the builders of the Great Pyramid to go to a very great additional trouble, not only to create this massive imposing monument, but also to lock it on to true north. He is still talking, but he is sure not answering the question that he was asked. Without skipping a beat or even taking a breath, he has pivoted away from the question he was asked. Changing the subject is a debating ploy and a type of logical fallacy. If he's not going to answer the question, why doesn't he just go ahead and stop talking? Instead, he's just starting on his spiel about made-up correlations without causation. And then other things. To incorporate into its dimensions the dimensions of our planet. I don't want to get too numerical or, or possibly even boring here, but if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. And if you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid accurately and multiply that measurement by 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. Uh, first of all, multiplying the dimensions of the Great Pyramid to come up with some made-up correlation without causation is a wrong answer to how was the Great Pyramid built, but he has already left that question in the dust. In other words, for thousands of years, through times, through dark ages, when human beings didn't even know they lived on a planet, never mind its dimensions, that monument has been, has encoded and speaks out the dimensions of our planet on a scale of 1 to 43,200, and the scale is not random. Now he is in his groove, just uh, of using poor research techniques to come up with logical fallacies. He's cherry-picking data points and then contending that uh, precision somehow validates a correlation. This is a very poor research technique, unacceptable to legitimate academic researchers. He's also saying he can understand all of this stuff that he says was encoded into the dimensions of the Great Pyramid and tell us all of the supposedly encoded information and peer into the mind of the builders to understand their esoteric purpose of the Great Pyramid. But how rocks were piled on top of each other is absolutely beyond understanding. Oh, brother! The number 43,200 is derived from a key motion of the Earth, which is called the precession of the Earth's axis. The Earth wobbles on its Harley, axis. Harley, cut the feed. At the He's rate telling of us about made-up correlations years. without causation that were conjured up by modern people with too much time on their hands. Fact, I think it's cut the feed, Harley. Cut the feed, and his response was a dismal failure as an answer to the question he was asked. Those types of poor research methods were used in the, in the exact same way over 70 years ago when people compared the Great Pyramid with the Bible. Great Pyramid Bible correlations without causation were, at one time, extremely popular. Modern people cherry-picked data points from the Bible 
and the Great Pyramid, then compared those unrelated data points in every way possible to come up with precise but contrived correlations without causation. Great Pyramid Bible correlations without causation are conjured up using the same invalid research method as Great Pyramid star correlations. Unrelated data points are cherry-picked and a contrived correlation without causation is perceived. Then the fake correlation is somehow validated by precision or math. Neither of these things validate correlations in the realm of legitimate academic research. Actually, Harley, uh, Harley and I produced a very good video which is on our YouTube channel that focuses on the flawed research techniques of the Orion correlation theory. It is an exhaustive explanation of why these fake made up Great Pyramid correlations are invalid. It is one of Harley's favorite videos and he uh, he recommends it. The link is on the screen so watch that video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll be glad you did. We have discussed a lot of wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? We just touched on a small sampling of wrong answers. Many people are interested in the correct answer to our question. If they are, then Graham Hancock is definitely not a very good source for finding out the correct answer to the question we are addressing. The correct answer to how was the Great Pyramid built would probably be a wonderful subject to make a video presentation. What do you think, Harley? Harley says it sounds like a good idea. I know that the correct answer to the question would be an interesting subject and worth pursuing, possibly in another YouTube video, but to do that here would be changing the subject. And even though people on Facebook and uh, the internet forums can't keep from changing the subject, we don't want to commit that logical fallacy here. So, there are a lot of wrong answers to the question we are addressing. What, Harley? What do you want? What? You've got a top 10 list? Harley loves top 10 lists. What do you want me to do with it? Read it? It's titled, the top 52 wrong answers to how was the Great Pyramid built? Oh, Harley. Thanks, but there is no use reading a long list like that. People can just re-watch the video. Sometimes, Harley, you come up with some of the weirdest ideas. How about I post your top 52 list uh, on Facebook instead of reading such a long list now? Harley seems dejected but at least we got out of reading it. Uh, so all is good. In conclusion, we learned a lot of stuff. We learned what people will give uh, many wrong answers to the upfront, upfront, straightforward question, how was the Great Pyramid built? When they tell you when it was built, it is a wrong answer. When they tell you why it was built, it is a wrong answer. When they tell you who built it, it is a wrong answer. People also try to lump all the pyramids together and try to tell you how vastly different pyramids must have all been built in the same way, uh, that which is a wrong answer. Or people will gladly tell you about fake passages and chambers when asked, how was the Great Pyramid built? All of that is wrong answers to our six word question. Now that you are on your way to being well equipped to recognize wrong answers, what do you do with that powerful ability? First, when you are told wrong answers, you are now well equipped to recognize and then reject the wrong answers you have been given to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? I know there are people watching that give wrong answers to the question we are addressing. If you give people any of the wrong answers we have highlighted, or even other wrong answers we didn't get to, this video was created to help you to stop doing that. 
it is inappropriate to provide wrong answers to people and to do so when you know better after watching this video will make you look like a poor researcher and disingenuous. So if you give wrong answers, stop doing that. Wrong answer givers will pull out of a hat stuff that has nothing to do with answering the question, how is the Great Pyramid built? They will start yammering about Thrawn or Thor, gods, religion, Bible prophecy, aliens, Nephilim, Akinaki, Emerald Tablets, Pyramid Texts, King's List, Book of Enoch, Imhotet, and go on and on and on. Don't give people those wrong answers when you are asked the question addressed in this video. Doing that makes you look uh, makes you a poor source of information and the people who have watched this video will call you on the carpet for that type of disingenuous shenanigans. Yes, I said shenanigans. We learned that people like to give wrong answers and when those wrong answers are questioned, they get upset and will lash out at you and attack you for holding their feet to the fire. I rarely give advice I'm a humble researcher and I am naive enough to think that the people I encounter are humble researchers as well. But that is not the case. All I ask you to do is bear the burden of conducting your own research on, onto your own shoulders. It is your responsibility to do your own research. It is your responsibility to understand uh, and use valid research techniques. Don't just point to some book author and say, I believe what he says, or pick out someone in a documentary you saw on television and then believe that person. This famous quote is very appropriate. But instead of asking the wrong questions, people are often telling you the wrong answers, which keeps you from the true answer to the question. Wrong answers are an attempt to keep you from the truth. Transcending the mountains of falsehoods provided as answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built, is a difficult and daunting task. This video is not the place to educate you on valid research techniques, but I do want to tell you one thing before we finish this video to help you on your quest for understanding and help you be a better researcher. Honestly seek truth. It will cost you dearly, and it is often an intimidating pursuit and a difficult task, but seek truth. There are many obstacles on the way besides the wrong answers you will receive, but pursue truth with all your being. The process of seeking truth is always expensive and always worth it. Honestly need truth. Embrace the position uh, that truth is the pearl of great price worth any cost. Don't be like Graham Hancock and contend that the truth of how the Great Pyramid was built is unachievable, that we don't know because we don't know. If you don't think you cannot know truth, then your fate as a researcher is already sealed. Honestly love truth. The effort to seek truth is always difficult and always worth it because truth is priceless for truth is one of the very few things in our existence that will break the bondage of falsehood. Truth will set you free from the wrong answers that have encapsulated the Great Pyramid in a shroud of falsehood. Seek truth, need truth, and love truth as a way of casting away the false answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? If there is anyone still watching, I have written two books about the Great Pyramid. My first book is titled Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid. This book describes lost high technologies associated with the Great Pyramid. My second book is titled The Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine. Both books are available in softcover or Kindle ebook format. The direct links to my books are on the screen. I have also produced two documentaries about the Great Pyramid. The first documentary is titled, How the Great Pyramid Was Built Using Water Locks and Barges. The second documentary is titled, The Great Pyramid Water Pump. 
Both are available as DVDs from Amazon.com. The links for these documentaries are on the screen. The interest in this direction of research has been very high. As of this taping, I have been on over 120 radio talk show interviews discussing my books, DVDs, documentaries, and uh, the, my research concerning the Great Pyramid. I hope you become familiar with my books and research and can contact me through email at our website at thepump.org. While at our website, you can find out more about our nonprofit foundation, ask questions, become involved in our activities and research, or schedule a radio interview. Thanks, Harley, for all your help. You are awesome. Please watch our other videos on our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay updated as new videos are made available. Like us on Facebook if you get a chance. Thank you again for watching this informative video about the wrong answers to the question, how was the Great Pyramid built? May you love truth and seek truth as you engage in scholarly research using valid research techniques. Thank you.